It's my great pleasure to introduce my friend uh, Hartman Nevin, who is the head of uh, Google Quantum AI and was in charge of the project that led to Google achieving quantum supremacy a few years ago. And uh, he's going to talk about uh, research program testing the conjecture that quantum operations are necessary and sufficient to create sentience. Hartmut Nevin. Good afternoon. And, uh, thank you for inviting me to the, this fun conference, uh, Stuart. So. Yeah, uh, Stuart already mentioned the title. By the way, since we have about... An yeah, happy to do that. So, um, since we have about an hour, um, I don't mind if you ask questions along the way. You know, sometimes that um, livens things up a little bit. Um, so, I mentioned here a number of um, collaborators who... So, don't blame them, please, for any pieces in this you don't like, but they have inspired my uh, thinking. Um, and also, uh, there's a collaboration that is coming up uh, that you will see. So, there are some uh, photos from the Kozak and uh, Bowmeister labs. So, obviously, the research program called well, Testing the Conjecture that Quantum Operations are necessary and sufficient, it's a very massy language um, uh, to create sentience that would not have happened without the work of uh, Roger Penrose and Stuart Hameroff. I think that's why we are here. And it started in 1989 with this uh, seminal book uh, from Roger Penrose, uh, The Emperor's New Mind. And Roger there suggested an intriguing idea, namely that he uses slightly different words, but uh, paraphrasing it, a conscious moment occurs when the quantum mechanical wave function of a system collapses via objective reduction. So I know in this room you're probably 70, 80 percent know very well what um, a quantum mechanical wave function is or what a superposition state is. But just for the, to include the remaining 20, 30 percent, um, let me give you, because if you don't know what this is, you will not enjoy um, the rest of the talk. So let me quickly give you, those not familiar with it, um, a brief intuition. So when I give some, uh, let's say, talk at a forum, for non-scientists, um, the way I introduce the notion of superposition state is as follows. And I will pull out, I don't have it here right now, I will pull out three coins and I throw the coins on the table and I say, look, it's heads, heads, heads. So that's the state of the system. And this system essentially, a numerical physicist would say, oh, these three coins are three bits. It's heads or tails, zero or one, you have three of them, so three bits on the table, etc. Et and then what physicists do, and also what do we do, what we do in everyday reasoning, is if you would know what influences act on the system. Let's say I would know Stuart is going to come nefariously and flips one of those coins around in a minute if I were to know this, and other people coming maybe messing with the coins, then what I can do, if I know all the forces acting on the system, I can make a prediction. Yeah, that in 10 minutes, it will not be heads, heads, heads anymore, but it will be tails, 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 or tails, tails, heads, depending on which forces act. So this is how Newtonian physics works, and this is also how we reason pretty much day to day. But quantum physics tells us this is only an approximate story. The real story is a little bit more complicated, and the, the basic lesson of quantum mechanics is that every object is really a multi-object. So in this situation here of the three coins, the three bits on the table, quantum physics would say you shouldn't only consider what happens to the heads, heads, heads configuration. There are other configurations too. Actually, we can quickly count how many configurations there are. There are three coins, and each coin can be in two configurations, and it's two configurations for one coin, four for the second, for three coins, it would be two to the power of three, so eight different configurations. And quantum mechanics tells us you need to consider all these 
eight configurations, see how each of these configurations is changing over time due to the forces acting on the system, and then they interfere in certain ways, and that is how you make a more precise prediction. Yeah? And then, so essentially, a superposition state is a sum, a complex sum, it's shown here in a mathematical format, where you have classical configurations, those phi i's, and here in the coin example, a classical configuration you can think of any one of those eights. Yeah? Heads, 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 tails, tails, tails. Yeah. And then, what's also important to realize, I explained this for three coins, but we are sitting here in a room and we are configuration two. And we could be in different configurations also. And textbook quantum mechanics has it that there is no scale limitation for up to which the laws of quantum mechanics hold. So they also, as far as we know, hold for macroscopic objects. So the other configurations that we don't see here right now, how we could be sitting, the overall universe in this context called a multiverse should also exist. And now, of course, the question is why are we aware of this configuration and not the many other configurations that a large superposition state or quantum mechanics tells us should be there too. And that makes Roger's idea so compelling. He essentially suggests that the multiverse is described by this large superposition state, but then we select or a measurement process selects one out of these many configurations that should be there. And that's attractive for two reasons. One, it gives us a place where we can put, it, it's what Christoph would call the physical correlate of consciousness. So there is a concrete proposal here that as this wave function collapses to one single classical configuration, then we become aware, consciously aware of this classical configuration. And a second interesting thing you could put there, this could be the locus for agency. Do we have, at least in principle, do we have any choice in which configuration gets selected? Or the system that is described by the superposition state, does this have any choice into which configuration to collapse? Yeah, and here's important to know that textbook quantum mechanics would say nothing before the collapse happens, nothing in the past of the system, physics language is nothing in the reverse light cone of the system, so nothing that can causally influence it would predict into which of the configurations it collapses to. So you have, the system has full freedom in a way to select one of the, over the other configurations. Yeah, so it's a nice place to put conscious experience. I become consciously aware, or the system becomes consciously aware of the configuration it collapses into, and possibly there, Roger said it this morning, that's maybe the best place he's aware of where to locate agency in physics. Yeah. So that was were the ideas from this book, and I got ever since it came out, I was inspired by it. But I have to say that I would like to distill or make it a little bit more abstract. Because Roger has a very specific idea how a wave function should collapse. He appeals to gravity, and he said gravitational influences will sort of automatically, in an objective way, reduce the wave function to just one classical configuration. But it's important to realize that, I don't know, I haven't made a poll, but 90 plus percent of physicists don't think that objective reduction is a thing. Yeah? So that we should not lose sight of this. And personally, I would my money, put my money on, it is not a thing, it doesn't exist, we won't find it. The good thing, of course, is it's experimentally testable and people actually here in the room uh, try to do that. And actually, the collaborator I mentioned, Dirk Baumeister, is working on that as well. So, but still, 
we have textbook collapse mechanisms. So the basic abstract idea can still survive even if we don't have gravitational effects causing the collapse. Yeah. The second thing, and that's maybe me not having researched um, Rogers and Stewart's papers carefully enough, typically uh, Roger discusses these mechanisms with sort of a single electron. You saw these pictures this morning, electron going here, going here, creating two space-times, nature not liking this, and then snapping back into just one. But there are, as we will see later, some issues when it comes to this idea in the context of multiple entangled qubits. So therefore, I would like to take the ideas of this book and sort of distill, strip everything away that you possibly don't need and just say the abstract nugget, what was proposed, is that consciousness is how a system experiences the emergence of a unique classical reality. That is sort of the abstract nugget that I see here in this book and in the work of um, uh, Roger and Stewart. And I call this the generalized Penrov hammer of conjecture. So, so that's inspiration. And when Stewart invited me to this conference, he said it will be called a revolution in neuroscience. Then I thought, okay, what my contribution will be to this event, I will bring the manifesto. No, there has to be a manifesto for <laughs> every revolution. So here, let me read off um, the statements on the manifesto. So the first thing, and that has always bugged the hell out of me, like, is the study of consciousness really in the realm of experimental science? And here I would claim it is. We can actually test these ideas. And second, this may be the weakest point, always tie myself up, um, is, this, is I thought we could, by, by studying, uh, I should go through the details in the appropriate slides, but I think, thought, that you can make an argument that probabilistic Turing machines, that's essentially the model, the abstract computer science model underlying your laptop, it's also the abstract computer science model underlying a Google data center, and there you have certain operations, you have deterministic operations, and you have access to a source of randomness, um, that's how computer scientists call it. These are the operations available in a probabilistic Turing machine, and that those may not suffice to implement the physical correlate of consciousness, and I will try to convince you of that. Then, of course, this is to be contrasted. A quantum computer is not a probabilistic Turing machine. It has additional operations, and it can take a state into superposition, it can collapse a superposition, and it can grow entanglement. So what do these quantum operations add? I well, already said what Roger um, Stewart have to say about this. And we can discuss which quantum operations may be most suitable to implement the physical correlate of consciousness. And then, as promised, I want to suggest a sequence of experiment to test whether the inverse is correct, namely that quantum operations do suffice to create sentience and possibly agency. And then the last thing, you know, if you want to do a research program, if you have to be in technology around the block a few times, you know it's important to, good research is expensive and it helps if you can point to some reasons to do it in the sense that at the end there are some products or services that people may enjoy and that may justify investing in this work. Okay. Yes, almost. If, if, you, if you hold the thought for just a second, I will explain it. Will be, will become much clearer in a second. In, in, a, in minutes. Actually, no, in the next slide. Let's go to how can we um, test series of uh, consciousness. Oops, other direction. So, it goes as follows. So, key challenge 
because when attempting to construct a scientific theory of consciousness is that conscious experience is not a traditional experimental observable with an associated well-defined measurement protocol. And my example is always um, as follows. Imagine an airplane and engineers build a new jet engine for that airplane and predict, hey, with this new engine it will fly a thousand kilometers per hour. Then any good engineer or any engineer <laughs> would say would know how to verify this. You whip out your yardstick and you whip out your clock and you see the airplane swooshing by and then you measure the velocity and then say, yeah, you were right, thousand kilometers per hour, congratulations. But now we ask another question. The autopilot you know, it has plenty of sensors, you know, airspeed, you know, um, GPS, um, position of the flaps and so on. So a whole series of sensory signals come into various processes that can do calculations, it has memory, it has lots of actuators, you know, it can increase the thrust or it can change the position of the flaps. So we can ask the question, the autopilot, is it conscious? It looks a little bit like an artificial creature. You know? And so how would we go about it? We would, um, let's say, go to Julie Tononi or Christoph Koch and they say, oh, please uh, compute the IIT measure for this, the phi measure which uh, portrays to or portends to give us an idea how much conscious experience the system can hold. And even though it's difficult to do, they could in principle calculate it for this um, aircraft controller and say, oh, look, it has a phi value of a thousand. So, but then what's next? How do we test it? Now nobody knows what the measurement protocol is and we are stuck here. That's why sometimes my colleagues say the study of consciousness is outside of experimental science. And on the philosophical side, um, the uh, solipsism, you know, solipsism is the idea that the only conscious thing in the world is myself, or from your perspective, yourself, and everything else might just be a projection that there's really only one conscious um, thing in the world. This is widely considered as logically closed. So strictly speaking, I cannot even prove to you beyond doubt that I am conscious. Yeah. So, how to get out of here? Here's a loophole. So the loophole is that by extending my own or someone's physical sub-correlate or substrate of consciousness, one should be able to test certain features of a theory of consciousness. And I sketch this out here in, I mean, there are years of experimental hardship, so take it as a conceptual proposal, this is not realized, and it's a research program, but in principle that should be conceptually sound. And it would go as follows, like in various talks from Roger Stewart, others this morning, we heard that the, again, the Penrose Hemerov conjecture says superposition states form in our brain, let's say in microtubules or other suitable neural substrate, of course, they collapse at some point, whether with OR or otherwise. I think nobody, I think that would be widely consensus. You know, you can talk probably to any hard nosed pharmacologist, chemist, physical chemist, and they would say, sure, on a low enough level, superposition states will form and they will collapse. They will collapse actually rather fast. But so there are these psi me's in my head and forming and collapsing generating a stream of conscious moments, or for short, I will adopt Stuart's Bing terminology. So a stream of Bing happening in my, Bing's happening in my head. Sorry? Google okay using Bing? Oh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> hadn't thought about this. But in this context here, it's, it's perfectly fine. So then the second thing I take is one of our chips. Yeah, so we, um, in our chips, I 
We also know how to make superposition states. That's the whole point of a quantum processor. So we have a Psi chip there and also know how to collapse them. You know, we, by measure them, them and to not pick a fight with Roger, I say, okay, okay, you know, when the um, measurement occurs, you know, eventually there will be a mass displacement involved large enough to go beyond E sub G and then it collapses. So we, we don't have to debate this in a way, a, a fine point. So initially these things are separated, then the two wave function or the overall system is what uh, quantum computing people would call it's in a product state. And then what we do next, and here's of course the um, experimental hardship, we will do some coherent coupling. Yeah, think of a nanowire that we bring close to a microtubule or we would um, do some optogenetics and collect some fluorescent um, photons from some neural structures, or we would use a nitrogen vacancy a qubit and bring it close to uh, nerves and pick up the changing magnetic field when a spike comes by. So many choices to do that. And then we connect it to a quantum processor. And what happens then? A larger wave function forms. Let's call it psi cyborg because now it involves a user's brain and a chip. By the way, the overall setup I call the expansion protocol. So now we have a larger wave function, and now let's tickle this larger wave function by some measurement, and when it collapses, then I would think, let's see whether Stuart Roger would agree, um, this should lead, if properly organized, to a richer experience. Why? Because psi me was maybe spanned over n qubits, let's say n aromatic uh, rings, you know, like nature's qubit, like Stuart convinced me of this, that they would be marvelous, and Dante as well, these would be marvelous um, natural qubits, and the superposition grows over n, let's say, here in our superconducting chips, we have, let's say, m qubits, so initially you get sort of Bing's worth n bits, and here this chip on its own would have Bing's worth m bits, but when it's coupled, then it should be an experience of n plus m bits. And it should be possible, you know, like we have this, do an experiment, you know, you have the big button under the table, and then you ask, hey, Stuart, would you mind wearing sort of the setup that um, creates a um, coherent coupling? And then we ask, all good now? How do you feel? Yeah, like always, like default conscious. How about now? Oh, yeah, still like normal. Then you press a button and then whoop, oh, what happened just now? So a richer than normal experience may be noticeable at that point. Moreover, if you had an idea what is, it, we know that consciousness has flavors. Now there are pleasant and unpleasant states and we could possibly have conjectures which states feel pleasant, which ones feel unpleasant, or we could search for those, and then we could test whether we can reproducibly do that. You know, have you have a, a sad or a happy experience. So you can try more things than just saying, oh, was it a richer experience? We can maybe predictably um, flavor the experience to come. Okay, so this is my pitch that this expansion protocol is a loophole to solipsism and allows for testing, at least in principle, this theory of consciousness. So is the output that you're looking for the, the humans kind of this thing, feeling more alive or conscious? So will you repeat the question real quick? Okay, uh, is the outlet you're looking for that the human attached to this quantum computer, okay, you press the button, now it says, oh, now I feel more alive, or now I understand Einstein, or something. Yeah, it would probably depend on what states we choose, but it, the initial thing that you somehow feel it's, and the, the phi would be larger. It's sort of it's a more bits than usual experience of something. What the something is would depend on what classical configuration gets picked. 
but you'd be looking for a uh, an output in consciousness as opposed to an output in computing power or something like that. Yeah, it's not designed to make more compute power. It's right. this, this system is designed to test whether sort of in a predictable, reproducible way at certain moments in time I can create for the user that submits uh, himself um, to this more conscious paradigm, right. you can make that person experience richer things Excuse and possibly give it also colors. How, how would that be any different from sticking electrodes into, into the visual cortex and giving hallucinations? I mean, what's the, why, what's special about, about the quantum chip versus just straight classical electrical stimulation? Yeah, that, that's a, yeah, that's a good question. Why do we want a coherent connection versus um, an incoherent one? Um, now yeah, for example, we can, this paradigm would allow us to experimentally answer your question. See, if quantum effects do not play a role, then I can just increase the classical noise in my chip, so now it becomes a classical chip, and if you experience the same thing, then we would say, sorry, Roger, you're wrong. We don't need quantum effects. But if you only experience this in expanded consciousness when there's a coherent coupling, then, oh, we need this. This is a necessary condition to bring about conscious experience. So this would allow testing for it in a rigorous way. So, Arnold, uh, in our view, uh, uh, if they're entangled, E sub G and E sub G would be, let's say two E sub G, T would, uh, time T would be half, so you have a more intense experience with more conscious content faster. Yes, um, now you may recall, um, I mentioned this in one of the Tucson conferences, um, Roger and Stuart, they asked us once, um, based on OR, how quickly would wave functions in our chips uh, collapse? And um, Kostya Kicheci did this calculation, and it turned out if you could eliminate all other noise channels and just keep gravitation as per Roger's idea as his sole decohering influence, then a single superconducting qubit of the type we built would stay in superposition for a million years. This is because the only thing that's displaced is a Cooper pair, so two electrons. They have very little mass, so it's very far away from, from E sub G, so very slow decay. Um, so when we couple it, it would, I think it wouldn't fall apart that much quicker um, just because the chip is here. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I remember that, and uh, your engineer said 80,000 years or something, whatever. Yeah. But an electron is, what is it, one one-thousandth of the mass of a, of a nucleus? So it would only be a thousandfold, wouldn't it? Um, yeah, this is one of the assumptions that the only thing that gets displaced by a certain distance are Cooper pairs. Yeah. And this is actually one of my arguments that OR may not be all that important because building was my day job building um, quantum processors. Our chips decohere after, we improved it now, but about 100 to the 10 to the minus, minus 6 seconds, not 10 to the 6 years. So I always tell Roger, listen, our qubits are decohered before gravity gets out of bed. You know? So <laughs> these things, gravity wouldn't be any worry in this setup. You know, it would, even if it's completely correct uh, as Roger envisions it, it would not significantly, again, we, we don't have to pick the fight whether OR exists or not because measuring the qubits in the chip, Roger would say, oh, obviously, when you did this, you caused a larger mass displacement because now your readout electronics is involved and much larger masses are involved. But I can choose a moment when that happens. Cyborg chip. Did you restart the question? Thank you. Um, I just want to get a, make sure I understand your experimental design here. You're comparing the chip and the me on top 
mm -hmm. to the cyborg chip and the brain on the bottom. Yes. The connection on the bottom is a real physical connection. Yes. And the connection on top is there's no physical connection. Yes. Is that your so uh, when you push the button yes. for the top, you're actually not stimulating the brain. Yeah. On the, the bottom you are. Yeah, on the bottom we would sort of cause and collapse of the whole cy uh, cyborg. Okay, so that, that answers the question, I guess, you know, could you just be producing some physical change like electrical stimulation? Because there's no physical connection on the top. On the top, no, yeah. Okay. But, but I think the, the question of Daniel still stands. Uh, others have asked this too, like, oh, wouldn't you, you put some nanowires in your brain, something happens, oh, I have a different experience. How do you discriminate this from a proper enlargement that comes um, from something like the OR mechanism? But I already but, but there is no physical connection on, uh, on the top. For, for the here, no? Yeah. The system, okay. So this tensor or symbol here, in quantum computing indicates separate systems. Here there is coherent physical connections, nanowires, via photons, via magnetic fields. Again, there are choices um, to be had. Um, so I feel, since we asked a lot of questions, I might jump around a little bit and maybe stay with the experiment and then I come back to some theory part. So let me jump over a few things here I wanted to talk about. Um, so let me go, so we discussed this as a capstone experiment and given where the technology is today, this would be, let's say, all or ten years before we can properly do that. Um, and, but we can think of warm-up experiments that can take us there. So the first warm-up experiments would be as follows. Um, there is an interesting protocol to test whether a system requires a quantum mechanical description. And that goes as follows. You have three systems, Q1, B, and a Q2. And B stands for biological substrate. Q1 and Q2, as you can imagine, would be qubits. Let's say room temperature qubits to make it simple, like say a nitrogen vacancy um, qubit. And then we have a coherent connection to, and I envision this, we would do this with brain organoids, um, but you could pin down, let's say Anirban, if you're still here, you could pin down directly a microtubule, you could do it the same protocol with other biological uh, substrates as well. And then you couple B to Q2, but take care that there's no direct up we can mediate entanglement between Q1 and Q2. Because, and of course I know how to do an entanglement measurement between two qubits, that's just standard protocol. You know. So if I were to find this, then I know this is just mass, that the system B would require a quantum mechanical description. Yeah, this is, let's say, a follow, follow from constructor theory, actually from uh, Chiara Maletto and Vladko Vidral had heard this protocol for the first time, but when we discussed it in the team, people said, oh, quantum communication theory also tells you that a classical system cannot mediate entanglement, so it would have to be a quantum system. And then there's old literature about couplers in uh, quantum processors, which also, if they get too noisy, uh, you cannot mediate entanglement um, between them either. So this would be a nice way to warm up and learn how to make a coherent connection between a biological substrate and technical qubits. Yeah? And that's where, um, to my delight, at some point, um, uh, students from uh, Kenneth Kozik, who is a professor for uh, neuroscience at UC Santa Barbara, and Dirk Baumeister, they reached out and they heard about this program and said, oh, we can maybe help. We have actually a brain organoid lab and so here they gave me some pictures of the brain organoids. So here's this um, needle pin sized little clumps of cells. And here you see them in different stains. And then what I love about this platform, it's a very well instrumented platform. So they have high density um, electrode arrays. This is what uh, Dirk provides. 
So with the 26,000 um, electrodes, that I've seen newer materials where they, the electrode array is completely transparent. So you can simultaneously also look um, for optical. Um, so there's an optical sensor array underneath as well. Um, and of course, you can use all sorts of modern dyeing techniques. You can um, throw the organoid into an NMR machine. So there's, there's just many things you can do because they're very well instrumented. Um, because when I suggested this experiment to Dirk, he was saying, OK, that sounds all great. But you're speaking like a theorist, from an experimental perspective, what are the degrees of freedom we really need to couple to? Are these uh, spins or what? Um, yeah, what are, what are we coupling to? And these experiments, or we could now use the brain organoids to get a better sense of how do we want to couple. And then we are thinking of um, two experiments um, to do here. One, to my delight, this was already mentioned in various uh, talks, um, is to use xenon, which as you learned earlier today, is an anesthetic. And interestingly, there was this uh, paper from a Chinese group that showed um, that different xenon isotopes, so different numbers of neutrons, so which leads to one a slight mass difference, but maybe more important, or probably more important, is the nuclear spin. So there are isotopes with um, spin zero, spin a half, spin three half. And you, what they found is if they give these different isotopes to uh, mice, then they can determine by looking at the writing re reflex what is you know, the anesthetic uh, potency, I think so, the MAC, you, you, you call it, um, for the different isotopes. So this, you heard Luca earlier, I was glad he mentioned this experiment. He said, I want to see this reproduced before I believe it. So, perfect, let's try to do this um, with uh, the brain organoids, look at different activity measures, and see whether indeed gassing the organoids with different uh, xenon isotopes would lead to different levels of activity. Yeah? And then I envision this that we would literally crawl sort of after the xenon um, atoms and try to see like where are you going, what are yeah, what, which systems are you messing with? You know, that, and today there were already interesting proposals what may happen here. A second uh, type of experiment would go like this. Uh, you may know frogs, for example, uh, have retina sensitive enough to detect, uh, can be triggered, or nerve signals can be triggered by just a single photon. So they are single photon detectors. And um, in talking to Kenneth, he felt very confident that we can express single photon receptors in the brain organoids here. Rajneesh may know a lot about this. And then we could do things like this. We can almost treat it like um, a photonic quantum computer where we would uh, do an experiment like we prepare two entangled pairs of photons. And one photon gets hit um, or hits a detector from this pair as well then we would just look at a classical signal that comes out of uh, this single photon detector uh, tied to the organoid. And then we would post-select on this signal, um, again, measurements that are done on the two photons that uh, survive this. And again, we would look um, post-selected on the signal whether there's entanglement happening. And if we find this, then that's almost like the experiment here I ex explained earlier, would like to get to. But this is a great warm-up experiment to see yeah, if we were to see entanglement between this photon and this photon, then we know quantum coherent operations had to take place in somewhere in the single photon receptor. Again, a nice warm-up experiment. So these uh, mice would be partially, uh, partially anesthetized? These are not mice. These are uh, brain organoids. So we would have... So we have to find what's the equivalent, you know, to the writing reflex Mac. here. To yeah. Yeah. How do we determine the MAC here from brain organoid signals? That's an open question. Yeah, but still, they're going to have uh, xenon isotopes, so they'll be at least partially anesthetized. Yes. And then you're going to look for 
What exactly? What yeah, we would. I think we would just initially look at all the signals we can take and see what's changing, you know, and then eventually derive something of an, a stand-in for a Mac. You, know. uh, yeah. you need to explain to people what the Mac is. Mac is the ED50 for anesthesia. It's a gas con concentration where half of a, of a, of a mo mo uh, half of a number of mice would be able to turn over or not turn over or will move when you clamp their tail. Uh, or a patient will move or not move with an incision. So it's basically ED50 for anesthesia. Half the patients uh, are adequately anesthetized, half aren't. So we always give more than the MAC to cover standard deviations. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, with this, sorry, I jump based on your nice questions, I jump around a little bit. I want to get to one thing that, unfortunately, um, in the UK it's now middle of the night, but um, I had an important question for Roger, and after this talk, I want to deliver this to him. This has to do with analyzing his ideas in the context of multiple entangled um, qubits, and I think there are some attractive, but possibly also some problematic things we may see. So we want to answer which quantum operations may be most suitable to implement the physical correlate of consciousness. And to a Texas, I drew this a simple quantum circuit. So many of you may not have seen this. Quantum circuits, they look like sheet music. Now, so each line here represents a qubit. So therefore, we have three qubits here. And what you do, you initialize your qubits. Let's say, again, a, a qubit, no, I'm, I'm not going. I assume most people know what this is. So we initialize them, let's say, in the zero, zero, zero state. So each qubit gets um, put into zero state. Then we do some operations on those qubits. I will explain which ones we pick. And then at the end of the um, circuit, you measure this is a symbol for measurement. And then you get for a qubit either a zero or one, depending on the certain probabilities, depending on what your quantum state is, that your one or two qubit operations um, created until then. So. That gives us the opportunity to put the physical correlate, or we can ask, where would the bing happen here? So first thing we can do, we have again our 0, 0, 0 qubit, so this state here, and we just apply a gate that produces Hadamard gate that would create a superposition. So after we apply this gate, we have the state 0, 0, 0 plus 1, 0, 0. So in the creation, so we, the system now created, essentially it's split, uh, if you want, the, the multiverse. There are now two strands in the superposition state. And let's say from the perspective of sort of a single particle, a single state going down a Feynman pass, you may the system may find itself in this one or that one. And the next operation could be entangling operations. Let's say we do a controlled, oh sorry, this should be a controlled X on the first one, and then a controlled X on the second one, and you get a, this state here. It would become 0, 0, 0 plus 1, 1, 1. So I, I realize not everybody will appreciate these operations, but just we did some, we started in the all zero state, and we did some gate operations, you know, the standard business in our chips, and we make this state, it's, this has a specific name, it's called a green horn Seilinger state. And now we measure. And now I realize, oh, that's a question I would like to ask <laughs> Roger and Stuart, it's the following. Let's just measure the first qubit, only the first one. And let's say it's a, we get a one. What do we learn then, or what do we know now? We know the system, the overall system is in the state one, one, one. Yeah, because uh, there was no way to, to see a zero. Um, yeah, if we get a one, we know it is in this state here. So the question now is, how many bits of experience, or who participates in the Bing? Uh, a quantum computing person would say, oh, you just did one measurement on the state and you collapsed it. There's only one classical state left now, which is 111. So 
are all three qubits participating in that one Bing? It's a big real, there's only one Bing, but did all three qubits participate in it? Or only the first one? So in short, do we get, see these two alternatives, they have their pros and cons. If I say I measure the first one, but the Bing is distributed, then it's, it nicely explains the binding problem. This would allow, for example, Stuart to do what he did in his slide today where you saw all the different emojis. <laughs> because now I have at least it's three qubits, I have three, eight different emotions possible here. And if I did the thing, I mean, that I picked three is completely arbitrary. It's just for drawing it. I could have done it with 10 qubits and I would have 10, to, uh, sorry, two to the 10 different experiences would be possible. Um, but that's disconcerting because if I only measure the first one here and leave the two others alone, standard quantum physics has it that nothing I can do here, nothing I can measure here will tell me whether the first qubit was already measured or not. And if we say, and I always interpreted what Roger and you said, that there would be one being that would and that Bing would be shared by the three qubits here. If that were the case, then the problem is that this would allow for faster than light communication. Um, because if just if these other qubits here feel like, oh, something happened, and this could be, if it would not just be epiphenomenal, but it could start some signaling chain, then you could use this to make a Morse code. So the idea that you measure one qubit and it creates three bits worth of experience is nice in some ways, but disconcerting for mainstream physics because of, of that. But if we take the idea the other way around, um, that if the answer is, oh, it's only one bit worth of experience, then we haven't solved the binding problem. How do I get then to different flavors of experience? So one way to solve this problem is to go not to the end, where you do the measurement or where the OR collapses the state, but you go to the very beginning. You say, when I create a superposition, that's where I put my, my Bing. Um, and that would still allow you know, to solve the, the binding problem it would overcome some of the retro causality or the timing issues that uh, Roger uh, talked about this morning and other talked about, um, and it wouldn't allow for faster than light uh, communication. So essentially placing the Bing at the beginning when a superposition state is created rather than when it's collapsed might be the better place to put it. Okay, so with this I my jump is getting pretty late enough. I just finished then with, with one piece here that is also asking, um, answering your question, you know, like what are you suggesting? There's um, a sentient machine is built. If you think this through from a product perspective, that's probably the last thing you want to do. In, in a way, a conscious machine is besides ethical questions, is sort of an anti-product. You know, your self-driving car, you, you want a tool. You, know, you don't want, oh, I have the idea to drive there today. You know, so <laughs> it's the same with your um, chat assistant. You know, you, we want a tool, not something with a mind of its own. Um, so we are not suggesting this. Um, but of course, what you could do if this expansion protocol works we could think of systems as here yeah, just found on the internet as not um, our work, but if we were to be able to do a proper coherent coupling between a brain and a quantum processor, and if uh, Rogers and Stewart's ideas are correct, then we should be able to expand human conscious experience in space, time, and complexity. And that would be, I think, quite attractive. And maybe with this I will end uh, with a Feynman uh, mm -hmm. quote that, by golly, it's a wonderful problem because it doesn't look so easy. <laughs> Thank you.
Well, thank you, Hartman. Um, I have a uh, hard to know where to begin, but um, going back to the beginning, I think uh, that's that's fine. As far as having them all three entangled uh, and and uh, faster than light, I, I I don't see that as a problem because if they're entangled, they're really uh, it's an illusion that they're spatially separated. So um, I. I to me, it doesn't seem like it's going to violate uh, faster than light, especially if entanglement, the thing, uh, signal goes backward in time. So, uh, but I'm not sure about it. The point I want to make is that um, in, in Roger's collapse, all of the entangled qubits will collapse instantaneously, as opposed to like CSL models where it's one, two, three. And that would create a problem. But the fact that they're they collapse in OR simultaneously might get around your problem. Yeah, I, I fear not, you know, because in a, I mean, it is, of course, well studied that sort of an entangled pair of um, qubits does not allow for faster than light communication. It's a correlation, no causation. And I often say we can also do classical entanglement, you know, I can take two of those coins, you know, and put a heads and tails together and or let's take two classical magnetic needles, I put one up, one down, so the total magnetic moment is zero, um, not, no qubits harmed in the process, so entirely classical, and I send them far apart from each other and then you look at one and you see it's up, then you immediately know, again, no faster than light uh, travels as the other one is down. You know. And with quantum qubits, a little bit more tricky because we can measure uh, non-commuting observables. And the way is a very massy way to say it. It's an L2 and not an L1 correlation. But it's basically the same thing as with classical. And obviously, nobody expects in this magnetic needle um, example to transmit any signal faster than light because it's just a correlation. But the same is true for entangled qubits. They're also correlated in interesting ways, but measuring one will not tell the other, the other qubit far away wouldn't know that the other one has been measured. Hi. Um, so I want to just uh, make a comment and ask a question. So you're able to create like the chips you showed me in the taxi, <laughs> um, these uh, quantum computational operations where you're able to maintain coherence on time scales and presumably length scales such that the gate processing time is much less than the coherence yes. decay. So this circuit would be a tiny circuit for the chips right. we have right, right. now. Yeah. So you're able to do that, you're able, you have been able to demonstrate that you can carry out certain quantum logic operations in that form factor. Mm -hmm. and, and obviously the goal probably is to do that faster, better, cheaper, and et cetera. But um, my question is, can we, it seems like you can do that entire operation without invoking or even solving the measurement problem or collapse of wave function or any of that, right? Because you're not really, you don't really need to solve that in order to carry on what you're already doing. Is that correct? No, I'd say a typical quantum algorithm would very much look like this. Yeah. You, know, you always initialize and there is a, a bunch of nodes you play, bing, 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 you know, this is your circuit. And in the end, to read out the result, you need to measure, not necessarily all, qubits, it depends a little bit on your algorithm. If it's, let's say, a binary yes or no answer to some question, it's maybe enough to measure just one qubit. But for other algorithms, um, let's say Shor's factoring algorithm, you want to, let's But say, all of your quantum computations, et cetera, are happening sort of in the non-collapse state, so to speak, yes. until the final whatever output is spit out of your quantum computational system, is that correct? Um, in principle, yes, you can think about okay. this. There are, of course, algorithms that do measurements in between, and in, in particular, the very important quantum algorithms needed for quantum error correction 
there are cycles and you keep doing measurements in between all the time. But so let's, you, let's not get in, into this. It's, okay, but uh, so you have a complex problem. set of logical operations that are all happening in a system where coherence is maintained yes. and not destroyed by these so-called measurement internal algorithmic measurements. Is right, that yeah, so that's of course, you, you always, the resource in quantum computing is superposition states over more than one qubit. That's right. the, the fuel. If you don't have this, you don't have any advantage relative to classical machines. So this indeed, as you say, has to be maintained at all times. Right, but the point is that your, except for the final step where you spit out something into the, let's say, classical world. Mm -hmm. You're having a series of operations, and it sounds like internal algorithmic, quote unquote, measurements, mm -hmm. in which, let's say, the wave function is not collapsing according to what you said. Yeah, it's partially the, yeah, I hesitate to get into this. Yes. Um, but I can, I can maybe quickly, I don't know, explain this. For this, you essentially have auxiliary qubits. For example, you want to know, in, in quantum error correction, you know, we want to know, imagine a cosmic ray comes in, and it hits the first qubit, and it flips from a zero uh, to a one. So an error occurred, because now you have one zero zero and zero one one that we didn't want. So this algorithm on paper should make a zero 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 and one one one. So we have an error in the first qubit. I cannot just go and measure um, each qubit and say, how are you doing, how are you doing? That is possible in classical error correction, but not in quantum computing, because then I would collapse my state. But I can peek in in a roundabout way. I can, for example, ask, hey, the first qubit and the second qubit, are you the same? Do you have parity zero, or do you have parity one? Are you not the same? Right. I mean, it's similar to like when you have a sequence of stern gerlach experiments, and you make some selections which then uh, determine the downstream selection probabilities, right? Yeah, that's um, not exactly familiar with that protocol, okay. but sounds like similar, yeah. Right, but I guess my point is that it seems like you have a platform in which some of these theories of collapse of the wave function or the measurement problem, the 100-year-old measurement problem, could be tested. Yeah, and the, <laughs> see, the, the reason why I'm a bit excited about this um, but, is But do you agree that you potentially have a very, a platform in which we could test some of these ideas? Um, because you, you're able to carry out quantum operations successfully, and, the, and you're having certain internal algorithmic measurements. Mm -hmm. And you're getting, so there are ways in which I think some of these theories could be adapted to the tools that you have to try to test some of these ideas, including the 100-year-old debates with von Neumann and Wigner and Einstein and de Broglie and Dirac and all these people. So I think it seems like that this is a good uh, experimental medium to try to test some of these fundamental unsolved problems of quantum mechanics. Yeah, I, let me put it like this. Yeah. I would think this is the fact that we can now manipulate um, qubits um, or large number of, of qubits in very controlled ways lets us go into very high dimensional Hilbert spaces and test the foundations of quantum mechanics in right. a ways that wasn't possible before. Absolutely. So I think that's an exciting area to actually try to design experiments that could use some of these machineries to try to s test some of these theories of quantum mechanics. Yeah. Hi, my question's also experimental, but going back to a bigger picture, your little brainoid things that you have access to, um, I'm wondering if you can take the devices that were just in the previous talks and run around with them and then start, you know, you have all of these ideas. Um, what happens if you can hook up a person to an electronics? There's quantum entanglement. Does that increase the consciousness signal? Is that different than if the electronics are not connected? I think everything that you've talked about, you know, you could take a variety of measurement tools to probe consciousness. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. That's why I feel. I mean, there are many other um, ways, of course, to approach it. But one thing I like about the brain organoids is it's such a well instrumented platform, and you can many experiments that you can conjure up, you can with rather low overhead um, uh, test it here. And of course, you would do this before ever a human subject would get involved. You know, you want to know that your techniques are all working. For example, if, if this could fail, you know, if this here, if this doesn't work, if you can't entangle two qubits via a brain organoid, I think then I would say let's forget about the capstone experiment here. That will not work then either. So things can really fall on its face, but that's I think what an experimental proposal should be about. Yeah. So, um, is there a way out of this problem of? Well, there's two ways out of the, 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 the measuring gi giving you a speed of light problem. One is just to accept that, that there is superluminal signaling. It could just right, happen, and just yeah. live with it. We right? haven't seen that, it that's, yet. Yeah. You know, uh, and the other one is: can you? Is there a way out by which you you don't make a measurement operation? You let the thing measure itself. So you connect the thing up to a finger, and you say, you know, raise your finger when you've made your decision, and you let the thing decide and make a decision. You don't actually go in and measure. Therefore, you don't have a problem that you measured something in a particularly controlled way that forces you to then have a, a faster than light problem as a co correspondence. I mean, I fully agree with your first, you know, like maybe it's not for there's a loophole to, I, I hate to yeah. say this loud, but I mean, yeah. <laughs> we, um, let's keep an open mind where we can look for that. Um, the second one, of, of course, Roger would say you can't, it's not in your hands, you know, you can't delay the um, objective reduction forever. Um, this will happen at some point, and then the thing gets objectively measured by space time um, snapping uh, together, so it wouldn't necessarily be in our hands. In normal textbook quantum mechanics, um, it would be, we cannot keep it coherent forever either, because even though we, <laughs> will try very hard to build error-corrected quantum computers. Um, we can keep the deleterious effects of the env environment only away for that long. Eventually, this will collapse. And um, then, yeah, it's again not in our hands whether something gets measured. Nature will measure it. OK. Oh, Thank you for this uh, interesting talk. Uh, I wanted to ask you here what, um, uh, what you would uh, define as a, uh, a test of consciousness because what I see here is more about uh, testing the quantumness of system B. Yeah, it's all According to Chiara Marletto's and others uh, paper. That's completely correct. This is a warm-up experiment. This one wouldn't be able to tell us anything whether the organoid has some level of consciousness. No, this okay. is only to learn to do coherent uh, connections. You know, and can we mediate entanglement through this channel? And for the consciousness test, we need somebody we are certain is conscious. So let's take me or you, and then we check it out from our first person perspective and then maybe we can at least convince ourselves okay these ideas seem to be solid and by the way i think that there are a couple of experiments that that preliminary experiments have been done one with rat tissues um, sending entangled uh, photon pairs into um, brain tissues and then looking at uh, whether they remain entangled afterwards. Well, this has already been the, done? Yeah, the, the, there is an experiment, a more, quite recent one. I uh, would be and most grateful for if you yeah, could send me the I references. Will, uh, I will. And, and, then, uh, and then there is a proposal about using NMR uh, with uh, instead volunteer live yeah. <laughs> humans. And uh, uh, yeah, and second question is about in, instead the, um, uh, the, the, the operations, the quantum operations that uh, you have de designed afterwards. So in the next slide, if you can go, just one moment. Oh, if you, um, yeah. this was in this direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so here. Um, so um, having the 
collapse uh, um, doesn't necessarily mean that, that, that you have a correlate of consciousness, right? But, but that's Roger's basic idea. No? He would but th that, that, that will happen uh, um, because of an interaction or gravitational in the case of Roger, right? So while here your system remains coherent until the very end, uh, did, yeah, did in I this understand? circuit, um, Anita asked that earlier too, so in this circuit, but it's a special choice, mm -hmm. we only measure at the very end. And of course in our book, um, or how this happens, our chip, we have resonators and we bring them in resonance with the qubit, so there is a measurement protocol. Um, but Roger could still say, listen, I'm right, all you're doing there is by bringing more macroscopic um, objects um, into the readout chain, you cause a larger mass displacement and then a rather quick objective reduction collapse. Of course, most physicists would say, no, no, this is just a standard measurement process. But that was my um, ah, okay. soapbox speech in the very beginning that I said, listen, you can, even if you find one day or I mean, it's difficult to produce negative results, but if, let's say, various people are looking for, um, if I'm not mistaken, Dirk Baumeister is actually trying to bring heavier and heavier objects into superposition. And if Roger is right, at some point it shouldn't work anymore, it should snap back immediately. So you cannot bring into superposition objects heavier than X. No? And if you were not to find this, I would say, no, we can keep going. You know, so far, quantum mechanics always won when people made suggestions like this, even if they have Nobel Prizes. Um, so I'm saying that even if OR turns out to be not found, um, what's wrong with textbook collapse? Uh, the nugget of the idea that Roger and Stuart had can still survive, you know, even without OR. That's why I like to call it the generalized Penrose Hemeroff conjecture that doesn't rely on gravitational yeah, effects. For example, yeah, like textbook decoherent theory could. No, no, it wouldn't necessarily be random, it would only be random on the ensemble level. You know, like I often get this, this kind of when I say a sentence like, or oh, an electron flying towards a double slit. You know, nothing in its reverse light cone decides whether it goes left or right. And then people go, but this is 50-50 random. But that's like saying, no, 50% of the US population likes vanilla ice cream and 50% likes uh, chocolate ice cream. That's a population level statement. That doesn't mean that you don't have it. No, I always have vanilla ice cream. And the, this specific electron flying through there may have a very specific idea where it wants to go. So I think agency and sentience of which paths or experiencing which paths being taken, that is all possible. I would think with or without OR 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 standard textbook decoherence. I think you would have it all. I'm wondering if in your model, and maybe I'm just confused, whether the, um, the computer part of it is um, sufficient enough to generate the consciousness representations or whether it's you still need some other unknown factor from the brain, either as the code or the reader. And if it is sufficient, then maybe a better experiment to t test it, if you were to create this crazy cyborg thing, uh, would be to put the brain under anesthesia and then ask if you still remain conscious. So if the idea is correct, that the collapse of a wave function creates a conscious moment, then yeah, conscious moments happen in our chips every day. Of course, they happen everywhere else in the universe also. So this is the panpsychist view, which indeed I hold that uh, the propensity for conscious experience is not the exclusive domain of higher mammals. I would indeed think that it's uh, 
distributed property of the universe. It's just more, I like the, the idea of orchestration, you know, like it's a different whether there's, let's say, in Dante's sort of astrobiological, in the little bing, bing, bings, not very well orchestrated versus in a cell, now suddenly orchestration happens and larger superposition states form, which encode richer emojis as um, Stuart uh, showed. So that the, as a second piece, I would have to think a little bit whether putting the brain on anesthesia and then coupling what that would, what we would expect to see then. Um, yeah, I wanted to come back to Stuart's question about faster than light communication, uh, because I don't really understand your argument. So uh, if you just take like an EPR state and you send uh, one particle off to Alice, the other off to Bob, Alice cannot use that entangled state to communicate with Bob because yes. Alice is just going to get this random result that she can't predict. Right. And so she's not going to be able to use that. And so when you move to your G GHZ state, where you've got three qubits, it's the same principle. Yes. Now, it seems to me there's not going to be any communication no matter what interpretation of Bing or consciousness you lay on top of that. Um, one reason for that is the Bing or Bings, plural, are going to be uh, constitute the consciousness of a single being. So there aren't two communicators. So who, I mean, another way to put the question is who who are the two people that could potentially communicate with respect to this faster than light information? Yeah, but we could envision if if you have a setting like this. Maybe we should look at the one picture which has a little dotted line here. Um, so if let's say there's a thought, see, the, the reason I stumbled on this was the following, in this uh, coupling, sorry, uh, I apologize for, here, in this setting, you know, if I were just to measure here, I know how to collapse uh, um, a wave function or the part that lives in our chips. You know, that's, I just send some signals down, we measure, we collapse it. Um, then if it would be in a suitable state, like a GHZ state, then it would also collapse here um, in the brain. So it would then the, the whole n plus m qubits are now in a definite state and I know this. And then again, my question to Roger is who feels it? Just the qubits that are measured in here or all qubits that were part of this psi cyborg state. So I think here it, it does matter. Um, there's, there's a difference. No? If it's entangled, I'm pretty sure it's all of them. So they're all involved in constituting the conscious experience in orco R as I understand it. Right. I'm just wondering so how, how do you think were, Okay, if that was the case, and let's just imagine we make these cables very long, <laughs> and then it doesn't even have to be colored. If, if this part here, the brain just went, whoop, you know, like I, there's a bing for me too then you can set up a protocol uh, setting up a Morse code, you know, bing, non-bing, bing, non-bing, non so, so we can start signaling now across distances um, that light couldn't cross in that time. Yeah. So I feel like the bings are just random, just like in the Alice and Bob case, but maybe we can talk more about it afterwards. Yeah, in the Alice and Bob case, nobody suggests that um, yeah, you, you measure Alice and then Bob has no idea about it. Um, in the Bing idea here is, again, it's a holistic system, a wave function, spanned over two qubits, it collapses, is the Bing felt by both parties. Um, as, as soon as, oh, sorry. Yeah, you can send a binary sequence of experience, no experience, 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 experience. So now I can send a signal. Yeah. Right? And, and you can be extremely distant from it. Yeah, I did hear it. Um, so yeah, to that, I would say, again, Roger says when the wave function collapses, it creates a, a bing, and my reading of the l literature so far, and uh, uh, Stuart even had this today, he had actually a three aromatic ring, and you had one wave function, and then uh, over lunch I asked, <laughs> Stuart, it's nice that you showed this, let's say we do a measurement just of one of the three aromatic rings, how many bings do we have? One bing, I think we all agree on this, but do all three aromatic rings experience, 
participate in this conscious moment. And as soon as you say yes, you have that problem. No, but if you're participating in the Bing, you know it then. That's why the other part is more harmless. This is more traditional where you say, yeah, no, only one portion of the system, the portions that are immediately measured, that had the Bing, the others not. That is the standard Alice and Bob uh, EPR pair situation. And that's a harmless one, no um, violation. But if, again, maybe I, I misunderstood Stand Roger wrong or uh, no? Stuart had this in his slide, so I don't think I misunderstood it there. Um, but maybe we are, we are harping on on the problem so much. Um, we can maybe also appreciate that there is a way out. Again, we if we place the moment for the Bing in the beginning when the superposition is created initially there. If we put it there, we sidestep these issues. And another nice thing with this experimental setup, we can test this. You know, we can see, you know, like we hold off with the measurement, what we start to create entanglement, and then we can ask the user, did you feel something richer just now or not? So, so this is also test, it's testable where the Bing happens. And of course, one thing I should always say, um, I think the orchestration or the organization aspect is important. So these bings, there can still be a self-organized process that just recruits those elementary bings into richer experiences. So I'm not saying that these very elementary physical um, processes is all there is. It can still be like in the um, more is different uh, kind of paradigm where it organizes into richer experiences. So um, I just want to get the terminology correct here. So if we use Schrodinger's uh, equation and the mathematical machinery of traditional quantum mechanics, psi, the wave function, represents the probability amplitude mm -hmm. not of a single qubit but of an ensemble of qubits. Yeah, here in this case, um, essentially, I could have written so it can psi never, equals this. It can never tell you the trajectory of any one qubit. It can only tell you the trajectory of an ensemble, which would then predict probabilistic behavior by definition of, let's just call it the low resolution machinery we have in 20th century quantum mechanics. Now, can we invoke the idea that there might be like hidden variables or something that could help explain the missing information to help, if we theoretically could measure it, could help us visualize the trajectories of an individual qubit. Um, so yeah, psi is a vector in Hilbert space and you would have to project it onto certain axes to get to the measurement variables and then the um, there's a probability associated as per Born's rule. Yeah, so that, um, like, depends I would. Here's my question is to use some of the ideas of hidden variables to try to map to your experimental platform to try to calculate where the trajectory of an individual Or of an individual configuration. Yeah, this would essentially undergo one Feynman pass. Right. You know, and what my view is that, again, we live in a multiverse, so there are other configurations how we are sitting here in this room. I would say, or I believe, they are in the multiverse right now, but we only experience this one here. So we are running down a Feynman pass. So we go from classical configuration through classi to classical configuration that many other classical configurations do that also simultaneously. But that's like saying the many worlds idea, right? Uh, I mean, that can be mathematically mapped to multiple trajectories. Yes. Oh, yeah, and maybe that wasn't clear. I never said this yet. I absolutely yeah. uh, a multiverse <laughs> guy, yeah. I, I think a multiverse is a, is a thing But mathematically, the idea of, you know, uh, many worlds or 
multiple trajectories can be equivalent. The question really is, is there a, a way the experimental platform could be used to determine the trajectory of a qubit or a configuration in a way that maybe would help us revise the mathematical machinery of quantum mechanics and help answer Einstein's worry that quantum mechanical description of reality is incomplete because it's only covering the behavior of a probability of a system, not the actual individual trajectory. Yeah, so before getting to this, you know, like I would think it's the simplest check is to see can we make ever larger superposition states. So the latest chip we have is 105 qubit. So essentially there would be two to the power of 105 terms in a big superposition state we can make. And it's in quantum mechanics is physics, it's not mass. So this may not be possible for reasons like, I mean, in this case, we calculated that we can escape uh, the OR hammer coming down on us for long enough, um, but still would give an upper bound. But it could be there are very eminent physicists on my team, I shouldn't maybe give their names, but uh, highly decorated, and they think quantum mechanics as we have it today needs modification. It's not completely correct, so they will look for these things. For example, one, you probably wouldn't mind, Michel Devore is an eminent uh, experimentalist, is on our team, and he thinks the H in the Schrodinger equation is actually has an it should be a complex number. It has an imaginary part that leads to some dampening. So that's why we don't see macroscopic uh, quantum states. So that's an alternative, let's say, to uh, right. OR. And he claims that, I mean, he's an experimentalist, so taking it from him, um, he said, in experiments we did until today, we wouldn't have seen this. So, yes, you can test certain modifications of quantum mechanics may become testable with these devices. Yeah. That would be fascinating. Yeah. I'm always torn between shall I root for the quantum computer working well or shall I root for discovering new physics, you know, like. <laughs> <laughs> Let me introduce a, s a simple idea here. Uh, and it also goes back to your very last slide, uh, conjecturing on the interface between you know, something that could be interfaced between a human brain and a synthetic quantum computer. It seems to me that we have, and we've heard a lot through this ent entire uh, conference thus far, focusing on microtubule observations in vitro. Uh, for instance, this morning in the opening lecture uh, on, the, on the tau molecular disturbances of the microtubules, can we conjecture to design some experimental system that has microtubule arrays? Let's just call that a black box. We'll, we'll worry about later what that should be configured in. But we want to interface that perhaps through proximity and not even necessarily through, you know, any kind of wires, or maybe through a common graphene interface between the synthetic quantum computer with, with your, the Google chips or whoever's and the microtubule array, and then look for ways that either direction interfere with significantly each other. That's just the suggestion for the next step. Yeah, I mean, talking to Roger, I, I made the case why brain organoids are an attractive um, a platform, but of course, this program would also work with microtubule arrays, or um, Anirbani might just pin down a single microtubule. These are um, as valid choices, I would say, and maybe even easier and should be done first. Um, yes, by all means. We could go on for a long time, it looks like. <laughs> but we have food and we have beverages outside and, uh, and we have an early morning at 8.30 tomorrow that's going to be awesome. And um, Stuart? Yes, thank you, Daniel. Uh, first of all, thank you, Harman, for a fantastic talk. Thank you. And, uh,